Hi, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for I will, uh, for joining us. I want to, first of all, thank the CIG and the organizers uh, for making this um, uh, workshop possible and for inviting me. We have um, a very exciting program over the next few days, and I know it takes a lot of work. So again, thank you, the organizers, for making this possible and uh, for inviting me. Um, I'll be talking today about the importance of poroelastic and inertial effects and in simulations of uh, sequences of earthquakes and the seismic slip and this is a work with a lot of people as you can see here on port elastic work with Elias uh, Hamison, Shindio Lu and John Rudnicki and on inertial effects with Valeria Lambert, Marion Thomas, Yi Liu, Hiro Noda and, and Jean-Philippe Wack and um, so it, it, we've had another workshop um, some years ago, three, four years ago on modeling earthquake source processes from tectonic to dynamic rupture, which a lot of people in this room who organized as well. And uh, there is a report uh, posted on the web. Um, and this is a picture. So it sort of encapsulates, right, the vast uh, uh, range of uh, spatial and temporal scales that we have to deal with. Of course, we all know that we have multiple couple spatial scales from the shear zone itself and fault core, which I will be talking a little bit about today, then to damage zones, deeper fault extensions, ductile transition, and, and finally fault segments and networks. Uh, we have also coupled uh, temporal scales uh, uh, from dynamic rupture, where you need a sub-second resolution to, of course, hundreds and thousands of years in, in, in multiple earthquake cycles, which is what we are trying to simulate, uh, uh, and, and all the way to short-term tectonics, where the whole uh, geometry of plate interfaces and subduction zones and so on may change. And finally, all of that right needs to incorporate multiple coupled physical and chemical factors, fluid effects, um, which is something, and again, I'll be talking a little bit about Today, both physical and chemical, and there is a version of the world where fluids sort of control everything. And then uh, time-dependent processes of damage, healing, and flow, realistic geometry and roughness and heterogeneity. So we will all be you know, occupied for a long time uh, uh, doing this. So I'll just touch on some of these aspects today. And um, uh, the, the many models, including the models my group works with, are motivated with this sort of overarching picture of the structure of the fault zones where slip happens on this highly localized shear layer, which we typically imagine is a fault interface, right? So a mathematical plane. Uh, uh, of course, it has fault gouge inside and lots of interesting things. So uh, generally speaking, described by some fancy nonlinear laws. And then it's surrounded in many models, uh, including some, including the ones I'll show today by elastic cost rock. Um, and there is slip across the fault. And we're trying to understand as you load this fault in a certain way, you know, how the slip will accumulate. So there is a wonderful introduction by Silvan and others uh, for, to this workshop. If you haven't watched it, please do, because it describes a lot of these things in, in more detail. So of course, what we want to make here is to make this slightly more uh, well, or somewhat more complex by assuming that the, the bulk is actually poroelastic, right? And so, uh, and uh, and so, this is this blue thing supposed to represent filled with water, which is coupled to the deformation, and uh, and um, uh, the layer itself now uh, needs to be treated or, or, or for for completeness. It, it's better to treat it as a finite thickness uh, uh, object. So, uh, of course, it's very thin, right? The dimension in the horizontal direction is in Perhaps meters, depending on the problem, to kilometers, right? And the thickness of this layer is in you know millimeters to centimeters. So it's it's um, still appropriate for the larger for elastic problem to consider it as a as a plane, but uh, this layer as a as a zero layer, zero thickness layer. But you know there is now a consideration um, where in this modeling where the the layer is actually finite thickness because it needs now to connect the varying pore pressure above the fault and below the fault right as you do this shear illustrated here the the uh, points above you know the fault compact uh, or, or, or there is a compressive for stress above the fault and additional dilation below the fault and that creates differences in pore pressure which will now somehow uh, go through the layer, right? So the, the layer uh, needs to have variable uh, pore pressure throughout its thickness. Now, um, eventually, 
Uh, eventually, we would like to also incorporate the effect of damage. They're not right now in the model, but we, of course, all know that the damage zones exist, as well as uh, heal and so on, but also uh, renewed by dynamic slip, perhaps even a seismic slip and fluid flow. So um, even without damage zones, there is lots of interesting competing fluid, fluid effects that go on, go on in this problem, right? So as typical in this business, we write the shear resistance of the fault as a friction coefficient times effective normal stress. And by the way, this very formulation has been questioned recently recently by some experiments where maybe fluid effects are more, you know, enter more pervasively and even poor pressure effects than just effective normal stress concept. But this is a very common way to incorporate uh, poor fluid pressure. And so the friction coefficient in this work is described by rate and state dependent friction. And there is a bit of where there will be additional um, uh, dynamic weakening mechanisms. But the poor fluid pressure itself can evolve in many ways. First of all, if there is something that's, you know, injecting fluid, and it can be uh, due to industrial activities if one wants to model that, or it could be natural injection or sort of percolation of fluid because of dehydration processes at depth. Then, of course, the pore pressure would change. And in particular, if there is an influx of fluid, it would increase. And that already sets up something interesting here, which is a competition between lower shear resistance. As you press this pore pressure, you get lower shear resistance, but also higher new critical length scales because they're all inversely proportional to the effective stress. So as effective stress drops, the critical scales uh, decrease, okay, so then it's easier to slip because you have lower shear stress, but it's sort of more, you, you know, you, you are farther from instability, so maybe you're going to end up with a seismic slip, and that's exactly what some fluid injection experiments and to someone see, you know, a seismic slip. Now, of course, another thing is this um, shear induced their latency compaction in the shear lay itself. This is sort of just a simple uh, illustration of that. Um, where it would obviously change the pore fluid pressure before the fluid has a chance to equilibrate, you know, with the surrounding. And then finally, right, these pore elastic effects I was I already described. So these are some of the ingredients we're trying to understand how they combine in, in this kind of model. So, um, of course, pe uh, people have already thought about, you know, there are already models describing these, these phenomena, in particular, a um, uh, model of, uh, for episodic slow slip, uh, models for episodic slow slip um, uh, is sort of uh, that we know occurs in subduction zones are commonly referred to the spore fluid pressure increase due to shear induced latency as the mechanism of stabilizing what otherwise would be an earthquake nucleation. And there are some interesting observations that one can try and match. So this is, for example, data from the Cascadia subduction zone where some detailed study of uh, how these uh, earthquakes occur, they occur here that like below the seismogenic zone in this blue sort of strip, which actually shows cumulative slow slip. Uh, in millimeters uh, over um, uh, several years. So here we see that um, if you plot the duration versus moment, what you see is that that scaling is cubic, sort of moment scales with the cube of duration, just like for regular earthquakes um, in this particular uh, study. And there were other studies in, in this and other subduction zones that confirmed this, which is sort of different from what was previously stated about a slow slip events, that the scaling is moment proportional to the duration. And this is data from, I believe, Japanese um, uh, a subduction, a Japanese, uh, a subduction zone in Japan, which one could also, you know, maybe put this cubic scaling through. Mm -hmm. And so, one way to explain, um, one way, one way to explain these events, is to allude to the latency or these uh, shear induced day latency effects, as done in a number of studies. Here, I'm showing something from the study by Paul Siegel, Alan Rubin, and others, where you know it's an uh, it's an elastic medium with a, a fault, and it has rate and state friction on it and then interfaces velocity weakening properties. And so without the latency, you know, you just have regular earthquakes in that uh, some geometry that, that they assume with slip rates of one meter per second. So this is maximum slip rates as a function of time. And this would be the, you know, red lines. But then you add the latency and, and the whole thing stabilizes to these black lines, which is kind of like slow slip events. And so one can take this a little bit further as we, we've done with Luca. Uh, and, um, and and sort of create a slightly and somewhat more geometrically realistic thing for Cascadia in particular, where these slow slip events occur in a sort of elongated uh, uh, segment below the seismogenic zone embedded into velocity strengthening. And then you can you can simulate a range of slope slip event sizes and plot them on this 
duration versus moment plot and uh, the data is in blue and the results of simulation are in orange. So with rating state friction and the latency, you can match the observations pretty well. So this is one way that the day latency is already known to lead to you know, slow slip events. However, another there, there's a number of models for slow slip events. I'm not going to enumerate all of them, but another one is sort of different conceptually because it says maybe slow slip events can occur as the stabilization of slow slip uh, by fluid pressure increase due to poor elastic effects. So here is where poor elastic effects come in. Uh, and so, as I've already mentioned, there is a lot of uh, water elastic effects, but one uh, important one is the coupling between the compressive and dilative bulk deformation and, and pore pressure, right? So as you shear, you create um, uh, more, 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 comp more, more uh, um, compression ahead and so pore fluid pressure increase and more dilation on the other side of the fold. So there's a pore pressure decrease. And then of course, this will try to equi equi equilibrate through the fold. Uh, and in particular, they change the effective pore pressure considerations on the fold. And so if you take what will otherwise be stable rate strengthening segment and add this effect, then as the study have shown by uh, Elias Hamison, Eric Dunham and others, uh, then um, you can destabilize. So slow slip would be here at 10 to the minus six. And now there is a slip pulse propagating along uh, uh, along this false slow slip pulse. Okay, so this is another way to, to get slow slip events. So here we are trying to combine some of these together, right? And uh, creating a model where uh, you have a pore elastic bulk and then this finite thickness shear layer to epsilon, which has diffusion both along the shear layer and across the shear layer, then diffusion into the bulk, and there is this pore elastic coupling in the bulk. So just very quickly, right? We have pore elastic equations in the bulk. Um, and uh, interface with rate and state friction times effective normal stress. The uh, stress itself, you know, is assumed to vary in the shear layer. So it is um, interface, zero thickness interface with respect to pore elastic problem. But while computing that effective stress, uh, there is a finite thickness layer consideration where the, the, the stress, of course, on the two sides of the layer can be different because, as, because of pore elastic effects, but also within the layer, right, the, the pore pressure can differ. For example, if you're injecting fluid, it can be higher, or if you are dilating and the pore pressure is dropping, it can be lower. So fluid can flow between the layer and the bulk, and uh, Elias, and, and with some help from us, developed the spectral boundary integral quasi-dynamic, so we'll talk about inertial effects in a moment, method for simulating uh, earthquakes and the seismic slip in this problem. So the, the, I'm not going to dwell on the details, but the model of the shear layer um, is sort of just derived, you know, before the numerical simulation starts, right? And so this is from mass conservation in the layer, you can sort of derive how this mean pore pressure in the layer, so this is delta PM, will change depending on lots of things. And of course, there is a pore elastic response, there is fluid flux, uh, uh, that, that you may be imposing on this layer, like for example, due to an experimental injection um, in elastic dilation that we've just a bit discussed, then um, diffusion uh, in, in the y direction, including into the bulk and then diffusion in the x direction. And for the dilation in this particular study, we are using the formulation from um, essentially Siegel and Rice 1995, but in a slightly modified form that they're using, but they're already referencing this in this form, where the dilation of the the layer is related to the state variable of the rate and state friction uh, uh, with this uh, coefficient gamma here. So just to show you some results, if you um, uh, study want to study something like a fluid injection into the layer, so we have this velocity weakening fault, it's initially locked and somewhat healed. And so we input this injection pore pressure into the uh, you know, a center cross, central cross section of the fault as done uh, in some field experiments and, and, and as well as lab experiments. And so we're actually using this pore pressure versus time and, and other parameters motivated by a field experiment in France. And then we are solving for displacements, right? So this is both shear and normal displacement around the layer and then for pore fluid pressure and you know everything else as we usually do in these problems. So what we see here is that, you know, notice that there is an important assumption here, right, where we are taking uh, 
the average of the pore pressure across the layer as the representative effective pore pressure change to, 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 to put into friction, which is commonly done in geomechanics. It's a very common assumption in geomechanics. And so with that assumption, we see that pore elastic effects actually stabilizing. So if we parameterize this um, pore elastic effect here by difference in the drained versus undrained Poisson ratio. So undrained Poisson ratio just put some deformation and you see how the medium immediately reacts, right? So the fluid has no chance to drain. And then the drained one is when the fluid has a chance to drain. So this is like the elastic, typical elastic properties. So the contrast between these two would be as a, a, a signify, uh, you know, some some uh, pore elastic effects. So here is uh, for those of you who uh, are familiar. This is the equation of pore elasticity, right? Where the bulk um, uh, components of the deformation are also linked to the change in pore fluid pressure through this alpha, um, and then um, then the relationship between alpha, for example, and the difference between drain and drain modulus uh, is like shown in this bottom here. So, so what is shown here, some results of the simulation where X is the distance across the fold and the, the horizontal distance is time in, in seconds. And so we're injecting this pore fluid pressure, pore fluid and the, the, the pressure evolves across the fold. So this is in red here. So the injection is in the middle of the fold and then it of course diffuses along the fold and also into the bulk and so on, but not shown here. And then in response, right, some slip starts to happen. So this is the yellow and first it's, you know, sort of very gradual and, and, and slow. And then these vertical, sort of extends, you, you cannot see red because it's like very faint, but there is a red line actually here where there's a seismic expansion. So this is like a little induced earthquake and then there is another one and another one. And just to make sure we are showing, you know, we, 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 to show that we are getting to very high slip rates, you know, you start with very low healed slip rates and then uh, during these expansions, right, the slip rate spikes to, you know, almost a centimeter per second or 10, 10 centimeters per second. And then otherwise it's slipping at maybe 10 to the minus six or something like that. And so then you increase this um, contrast. So you increase um, Andre and Poisson ratio. So that you sort of, uh, this is almost elastic, right? Because the ratio here is almost one, but then um, you, you make more of pore elastic effects. And then you can see that the pore pressure distribution changes because you change um, the properties by permeability properties as well by doing this. And also the slip is here completely, you know, stabilized as the result. By the way, starting with, I think, 1500 um, seconds, there is a decrease in, 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 in induced pore pressure. So that's what, what this is about, just like it was in the field experiment. So the large and drained Poisson ratio is in, in increases bulk fluid diffusivity. So that's that's one stabilizing effect. But we've done some studies that shows that there are effects beyond that. And in particular, you know, this nucleation length scale is increased as well. And, and, and even that is not enough to explain the amount of stabilization here. So there are additional effects that we are, you know, investigating right now. So yeah, as you can see, this is sort of on par. It's almost like we've changed velocity weakening fold to become kind of velocity strengthening or something. So this is on par with what would happen if we change friction, for example. So it's not a subtle effect. Um, then uh, we, of course, already know that the latency was also stabilized slip, as I've shown in for these slow slip models, uh, uh, slow slip event models before. So this is an example of that here is the same you know, nearly elastic, you know, very mild poor elastic effects kind of calculation. And then there is some calculation with a little bit of day latency. And this value here of the latency coefficient is one tenth of that inferred um, in the um, uh, based on the lab data of Maron in in in, in Siegel and Rice 1995, and so it highly stabilizes the slip that you would expect, right? So there is no more of these dynamic expansions here; it's just sort of slow creeping front and uh, and also the pore pressure distribution gets interesting right because because you have the latency on the fold where you have the front that the latency is highest so then the pore pressure even you know changes uh, pore pressure change is of the different sign right now here we have pore pressure actually uh, uh, decrease right and not increase as would be with injection and the whole shape is kind of non-monotonic and uh, not um, characteristics for a root profile and uh, you know and then if we add poor elastic effect on top of that you know the slip is further stabilized. 
So there are some um, interesting you know, effects here just due to poroelasticity. And um, just a brief comment, some people ask me, what's the difference between rate of state friction and linear slip weakening? And people have uh, long studied this problem with linear slip weakening for just to get sort of one dynamic event in this fluid injection problem. And um, so this is friction coefficient as a function of slip here for this particular, for one of the simulations I've shown for the first one that I showed on, any, on every slide. And you see that this, first we have sort of a more healed fold so that the peak friction is rather high and then kind of drops almost in a linear fashion because we're using the aging form of the rate and state friction. And with the slip form, it would be somewhat different, right? But but because it's more nonlinear kind of evolution, uh, but it would still look somewhat like linear slip picking and just somewhat nonlinear one. And then you got them settled to what appears to be a dynamic level but then, you know, when the next event comes, right, it happens on the lower slip rates and with less healing. And so the peak rate is very, very, the peak friction is very different. And then, you know, the third event has yet different peak friction. So for this particular rate and state formulation, it's like um, because there is difference in slip rate and amounts of healing and so on. Uh, uh, one of the main differences is the difference in this peak, you know, of, of, of uh, friction. So it does look like you know, linear slip weakening for each of these events, but but overall it's different in terms of its history. So just to finish uh, this part, and then I'll briefly talk about inertial effects. Um, so poroelastic properties significantly affect the stability of slip induced by fluid injection, for example, but, you know, anticipate, and, and we've already done simulations, of course, this broader, any kind of slip, or a lot of kinds of slip would be affected on par with the effects of inelastic day latency, and in fact, was changing friction coefficient itself, right? And these poroelastic effects can be either stabilizing in the study or I've showed you the study by Elias et al. in 2019 could be destabilizing, depending uh, in part on assumptions used for slip and delay, right? So this is a challenge here is what is the right thing to assume? So for example, effective pore pressure, which one to use? We can hear this study is using average across the layers, typical in geomechanics. Now the study of uh, Hamison et al. used maximum across the layer. Then of course it's a, uh, it's it's largest on one side of the fault, uh, and uh, then the, the the pore pressure is 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 lower there, uh, sorry, is higher there, and so it would be you know more destabilizing effect. So and th that brings about a more general question, which is obviously the slip will localize within the slay, like in this situation, if I'm dilating and my pore pressure is lower in here, and so the resistance is higher, why would I slip here and not elsewhere in this layer? So first I would maybe move the slip away from where I'm dilating and also maybe localize somewhere else. So we have to, so that there will be shear localization and delocalization and it may change throughout slip. So how to model that is, is, is an interesting additional problems. And, and there are some models of slip in the layer, but you know, they need to be coupled with the larger scale uh, processes that we'll hear about in these, in these workshops. So on top, you know, beyond what, what I was discussing here, there's already of course, other challenges, which is evolution of poroelastic properties with damage in fluid flow, and there will be a presentation, uh, several presentations in this conference, in this workshop, talking about that. Um, of course, we assume planar interface interfaces can be rough, which will add to the compaction dilation and other things. Um, there will be chemical effects and healing, which are not included right now, so additional healing due to chemical effects. And I want to point out that the model of the uh, layer is already complicated, and there are eight parameters that sort of collapse more into four or five, but it's already has a lot of parameters that need to be known, and any of these additional effects would bring about additional parameters. So the question also is how can we simplify the layer description in a justifiable way? So now I want to switch gears and talk a little bit about inertial effects. Um, and so there is a very, again, a, a great introduction to, to some of these um, uh, challenge, you know, inertial effects versus quasi-static and quasi-dynamic slip um, uh, on, the, on the workshop website. But basically, when we say we are studying fully dynamic problem, like here is what one way to express that. So this is uh, for a 2D problem with one default and mode say, sorry, it says two, it should be mode three slip. So we can write the shear resistance as some uh, shear resistance that would exist if there were no slip and plus some terms that modify that shear resistance due to slip. So this is the um, stress transfer functional that transfers stress along the fold due to slip. And then often this term is separated, mu shear modulus C sub S is, um, 
uh, shear wave speed, which is called uh, which is called um, radiation damping term. And so one way to look at these effects of the slip on, on the stress is in the Fourier domain as we do in our codes. So we write slip as a Fourier series worst coefficients dn, and you write this transfer coefficient transfer functional as a Fourier series with the coefficients capital F and, and this is just the Fourier number. And so then these uh, Fourier coefficients are related. So the stress transfer is related uh, to the slip obviously, and, and one can separate it into two terms. This is just a function of slip, right? So this is a static term. And this there is a convolution here in time uh, that involves the C, which is CS. Um, so it's it's um, shear wave speed. So this is obviously a dynamic effect. Um, and so now if you study the all of it for mode three slip, that's fully, fully dynamic problem. And then if you want a quasi-static, shear stress evolution. So if you never included the dynamic term, then in, in, in this expression, you wouldn't have this radiation damping term and you would not have this dynamic stress transfer expressed by this convolution. But then if you say, how about I include some of the dynamics because in fact, as the earthquake instability approaches and you assume quasi-static formulation, then the solution blows up. So not to blow it up and, and to do simulation throughout, what you can do is just you can make this little compromise of keeping the radiation damping term. So this dumps some radiation or some energy to the to the to the to the to the outside the fold and that hel helps the problem survive the initial initially controlled instability, but you don't compute this you know, troublesome um, convolution integral. And so if you, it, so this is for these uh, spectral representations on the fold, but in general wave effects are hard to incorporate, right? Because you obviously have to simulate the effect of propagating waves. And this is one way to do it in a simple problem, but it would be more complex or in, in, two, in other 2D and 3D problems. So when I say quasi-dynamic, this is what I mean. And this is what meant in a lot of problems, um, uh, a lot of codes. And of course it's, a lot easier, so many earthquake sequence codes are quasi-dynamic, as was my poor elastic example. So we, there is a way to develop a fully inertial version of that, but what I've shown so far was quasi-dynamic. So, and in the simplest models, it doesn't matter much. So the, the, the fully dynamic, or it doesn't matter as much. So in fully dynamic, fully dynamic simulations and quasi-dynamic simulations, result in, 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 in similar and, and, and generally simple earthquake sequences. So for example, this is a, a model where you have a vertical fold uh, with the velocity weakening region here shown in white surrounded by velocity strengthening shown in yellow. And we are showing how the slip develops along this red cross section. So this is a slip as a function of this distance along this cross section. And the green lines are plotted every so many years. So you see how you know, the velocity strengthening region here in yellow creeps on the two sides and there is occasional post-seismic slip. So these lines are further away. And then the slip in this velocity weakening is accumulated dynamically. So you have these red lines, which are plotted when the slip rate reaches, I believe, um, 0 0.1 meter per second, and it, it's plotted every two seconds. So this is very dynamic propagation. So you see there's this large nucleation zone, and then the event spreads from there, and there is another nucleation zone and event spreads. So this is the fully dynamic simulation, and this is the quasi-dynamic simulation. And you see that, you know, there is differences, of course. So the dynamic event here is not as dynamic, right? So the lines are closer together, which means that the rupture speed is smaller and the slip accumulation, in you know, is, is not as fast. But generally speaking, they look similar. There is a sequence of model spanning large events, uh, and so one would say there is some qualitative similarity, and so that justifies uh, using quasi-dynamic approximation, right? Well, now, unfortunately, so so one 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 consequence of using quasi-dynamics is that your slip, you know, even slip is reduced in many problems, but also slip rate in particular is significantly reduced. So this is slip velocity as a function of time at, at one point along the fault. And so this blue line is the fully dynamic, it reaches for meters per second. And the, at this particular point, the rupture is propagating with 2.65 kilometers per second, which is a significant fraction of the shear wave speed, which is three kilometers per second. But in a quasi-dynamic, right, the slip rate is much reduced more than 10 times and the propagation, rupture propagation speed is, 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 is also several times lower slip is also reduced. And this is because the stress transfer, of course, is different, right? 
So if we see the stress transfer functional in MPA as a function of distance alone default in a similar problem, so this is from Valera's study, um, we see that was a static stress, you know, transfer, which sort of what, what this problem has is, is has this kind of peak at the rupture front, and then the dynamic stress transfer has a much higher peak, okay? So the, when you eliminate dynamic effects, you sort of eliminate the, some of, a lot of the stress concentration that the rupture would have. And so what that means is that in more complicated problems, then you would change, you know, the results. So, and in particular in problems with heterogeneity, where you know whether the rupture propagates through something or not depends on how healthy it is, right? So this is an example where you have two velocity weakening segments separated by a velocity strengthening barrier. And so this is kind of a 3D illustration, but actually we've done it in a sort of depth averaged um, 2D model. So there is two velocity weakening regions along the fold. Um, this is A minus B of rate and state friction separated by a velocity strengthening barrier. And we kind of try to see how you know, these two segments interact. And so for some standard rate and state properties, if you use fully dynamic simulation, then you are in this scenario where 50% of ruptures jump across. This is the work, work with Valer. And then in a quasi-dynamic situation, none of them jump across, right? So this is the illustration of the rupture is weaker. And so um, you're not you know, gonna get the same answer in this interaction with heterogeneity here. Now, perhaps, you know- uh, more Nadia? In, Yes. I'm sorry, it's 9.32. Can you jump to your conclusions? So yes. we can- go So this is the last slide actually before conclusion. So that, that even more seriously, you know, if you go beyond some simple friction loss to dynamic weakening, which where things depend significantly on slip rate because um, many laws uh, relate to shear heating and shear heating rate relates to slip rate, then the quasi-dynamic simulation having much lower slip rates has even more dramatic results. So this is study with uh, Marion. Thomas, where, you know, if you do a fully dynamic simulation in uh, a model which has enhanced dynamic weakening due to flash heating, so it has rate and state friction, but also flash heating, then this is slip versus time with sort of similar convention as before. And so with flash heating, the model accumulates um, uh, here in a fully dynamic model, the slip through pulses of slip, okay, each of them about five to 10 meters. Um, uh, over here, and that's because the dynamic effects allow self-healing pulses to form. In a quasi-dynamic model, you remove that ability, and so you have these attempts to penetrate through these multiple small events, and then there's like a humongous crack-like rupture, because a quasi-dynamic simulation cannot create a self-healing pulse. Okay, these two simulations also have very different evolution of stress because of that, so this is average shear stress as a function of time, this is a fully dynamic one. This is a quasi-dynamic one. And then very different recurrence intervals for large events and so on. So just to summarize, this is the, you know, I already talked about the poor elastic uh, portion in, uh, in quite detail. And so for the, in terms of uh, summary, but then for the inertial effects, if you have a simple model with simple friction laws or relatively simple like rate and state, then yes, quasi-dynamic simulation and, and fully dynamic produces similar results, especially if they're simple like model spanning events. But the minute you introduce some heterogeneity and then the, the, the rupture would interact potentially differently with that, or if you introduce additional dynamic weakening mechanisms, then the results can be you know, entirely different. Uh, thank you for your attention.